so this might just be for me or might be for somebody might share with somebody might not sick of having good thoughts and then never recording them like Rutger Hauer said at the end of that movie Blade Runner are all these mem I have seen uh, suns explode on the shores of the galaxy of Orion are all of these memories to be washed away at death like tears in the rain time to die that's a good movie thought about six or seven things I wanted to record today the ultimate one, the last one being once again the constant one of the day and the night abandonment abandonment I was just watching a oh, a very nice talk which was shared with me by a friend from a friend on YouTube which was a discussion between some quantum physicists and the Dalai Lama with a very highly educated interpreter who was uh, fluent in both languages in academic uh, vocabulary and so the conversation and the discussion got very deep and very into detail into the questions of the existence of a self, an observer of the experience of phenomena and if there are any absolute phenomena which exist without an observer, beyond an observer or the illusion of a self who thinks he's or she is observing and I was discussing it on Facebook with my friends mainly one friend but some other people chipping in too with some good stuff and it's all good stuff and just about everything uh, we responded to each other with were challenges to try and find the inaccuracy of the previous statement of the other person and of our own statements and to destroy each one and we were basically using conditioned truths, limited truths, non-absolute truths to destroy illusory non-absolute truths using conditioned terminologies and conditioned concepts to destroy other conditioned concepts like peeling an onion but it occurred to me once again abandonment because this is what I like to call what I haven't yet abandoned calling um, wondering and wandering wondering and wandering wondering about this wondering if it's that wondering if the what is that I always forget what it's called the, where you put splits in a card and shoot light particle photons through it to see if it's a wave or a particle and the quantum physics experiment which is uh, baffling and inexplainable because it does one thing when nobody's looking and just measuring it and another thing when it's being measured and somebody's looking at it or something is look observing it which seems to quantum physicists to prove that uh, the observer actually affects the reality I actually think that all the other things are happening so uh, that both the wave that it's passing through one slit, the light, in particles, passing through one slit as a wave, passing through both slits as a wave, passing through neither slits, every single possibility and option, and every position in time and space, and every different permutation of put them all in different positions and try again, or try an infinite number of permutations, they all exist there in the realm of potential. And it's not that we are just creating this one thing that's happening, it's that all we're seeing is one of those if not infinite immeasurable and incountable numbers of options and possibilities of where a particle could be at a particular time where we could be standing and looking at it from where at a particular distance and angle all of those things have to be imagined first 
and created through our five khandhas, through our aggregates, our mind, our feelings, our understanding, our consciousness, our body to use, make measurements, our brain to think with. All of these, all of these uh, causes have to be there first, put together, built up, all these composite elements, these aggregates. Mm. But the thing is, here the conscious supposed observer that these people were talking about in the Dalai Lama and the quantum scientists' uh, debate, discussion, it wasn't a debate, it was a conversation which was almost agreeing with each other on most things, or finding ways to compare it in a parallel sense. And so, you know, is it not self? Is it self? Is there an absolute basic thing behind everything if there's no observer which I could and would probably argue yes impermanence constant change but I when every time I I confess that every time I begin to think those things all the things we argued chatting about it on Facebook about this discussion as soon as they begin to arise in my mind and I start to think these this view or that view the first thing I start to think, to see and feel is, I don't think it, I feel it inside. This is a view. This is a view starting to uh, give birth to itself. And it's going to take on such a solidity that at some point I'm going to believe in it so strongly that I'll actually argue with somebody about it and be on, say unskillful things or just suffer from stress inside from not being able to convince others of my particular view i don't want this this is a baggage this is a this is a bed sore abandon it and it occurred to me that these things we hold dear including the thing we call ourself which can be offended the thing this is unjust to me this is happening to me that is my things those are my things that is my life this is my happiness this is my whatever yeah this is happening to me it's not happening to me it's just happening things are happening maybe maybe they're not even happening maybe i'm just imagining it but the suffering which arises from the emotion and the emotion which arises from the clinging and the attachment to views and why because those views we have a self-identification problem with them we identify the self with the views and we think that the views that have formed in our mind are the self and so if anybody disagrees with those views they disagree with the self if they offend those views they offend the self if the views are not the self how can anybody offend them Mm? And if you think somebody offends them, are they offending the views or are they offending yourself? And why are they offending yourself if they're talking about the view? It's just a view you thought of. You might change it later. It's just a view. And if you take a cube in space and you place yourself outside of that cube somewhere on the perimeter in an imaginary spherical, let's say at a distance of what we call 100 meters, within visual distance that you can see one side big enough to see the details on it say that you look at the cube you might see three sides if you're looking head on at one of the corners of the cube and you can see what's painted on each side there's a different painting on each panel of the of the cube you will never be able to tell me what the other side of the cube like is like looks like or what paintings are on it or if it's there at all even because you can't see it from your point of view but that doesn't mean it's not there which is why two people can look at the same thing and see something completely differently but the beauty in that is that they might both be right and that's always worth remembering to not get offended if you do have a view if I have a view then just because the other person has a different view, it doesn't mean they're not right, and it doesn't mean I'm not right. Beyond that, even thinking and saying these, I have something present in my mind which says, even that is a view. And that all views, just like is stated 
in the Buddha Dhamma, as expounded by the Lord Buddha, that all views are erroneous. Mitatiti. Mitatiti means oh, wrong view, false view. And the Buddha did not pertain to any views, apparently. And that all views, the views that the universe is infinite, the view that the universe is finite, the view that it is neither finite nor infinite, the view that it exists and other that it doesn't, the view that it both exists and doesn't exist, or the view that both and neither and either and all at the same time, and the view that nothing at all, and the view that everything, and that all is one, and that everything is separate, all of these views are wrong because they're views and you can't see everything when you take a standpoint and see something from one point of view the only way you can see something is when you see it from every point of view and that needs to destroy self-identification through viewing self seeking within things this is my view, this is my house, this is my party this is my day off, this is whatever Mine, mine, me. Hmm. My food. <laughs> and so, they're, they're natural instincts, they're part of nature's uh, natural selection and evolution process, but our hands don't do those kind of dances. They don't dance. They don't dance. Our hands don't dance. And uh, so, abandoning wrong views of self-identification how can that be done when we love ourselves so much well by seeing that when we suffer when we feel offended when we feel sad when we get angry and so on look at why get angry because what he did to me what she did to me what she did to my friend oh well my friend that's not me I'm still getting angry isn't that because I'm righteous or is that because I'm egoistic how am I egoistic in that I'm sticking up for my friend I feel offended because they have they hurt my friend's feelings whose friend my friend oh it's me again they didn't just hurt anybody's friend because if it was just anybody's friend but not my friend I wouldn't give a shit would I? Or I wouldn't really feel so angry about it. And the only reason I feel angry about some person offending and hurting the feelings of another person is if it's my friend. Hmm? Or if it's somebody I know. Or it's something I heard about. But if I didn't hear about it, I wouldn't go out trying to find out about ones I hadn't heard about. Hmm? It wasn't, wouldn't be my business. It wouldn't be something I'm interested in. My interest. It's all me. It's all me, 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 me. And the only thing that makes us cling to it and get angry and get sad and feel lonely and feel hard done by, feel unjustly treated, and to get angry and but have the fires of anger burn inside us, this all comes from self-identification. And if we see that suffering and the cause of suffering being the clinging to the self-identification of this is my view, my beliefs, my religion, my country, my culture, whatever, yeah? The color of my skin, my uh, body weight, my foot size, my nose length, whatever, yeah? My, my sexual uh, inclinations, if I'm straight or gay or whatever. Mm -hmm. You get angry and you suffer. You feel hard done by and you suffer. Mm. And so if you see the suffering coming from this self, you start to abandon it. You abandon it because every time you see it arising, you see it dwelling within things. Instead of clinging to it and trying to feed it, you actually just want to dispose of it. And this ab abandoning the false views is very essential. And Every good idea and every snappy answer and every interesting comment and response I can give to the most philosoph philosophical conversations even, which are so close to the highest dharmas, dhammas, even those, anything that causes 
views and the emotions and beliefs and clingings and uh, notions which arise and begin to propagate themselves from those views. I find them fearsome. I find them to be abandoned. And, abandon and to see this, to start destroying this false view, you can, and see the suffering arising from it, you can see the fetters because of the self-identification which Buddhism, academics class, and even the Buddha in his teachings perhaps classed as ten fetters, split up into ten categories, can if you like. There's a basically a set of, a set of inclinations and ways which have to be abandoned. And the more they appear and the suffering and the causes, the, the things that cause, appears uh, the conclusion arrives that abandonment and the impermanence within them the three marks of existence within these things helps as a tool to soften their grip and to destroy self-identification simultaneously as you work along with it helps to destroy their grip and to see the suffering in them to really clearly see the suffering in them and the endlessness of samsara within them, the becoming within them, and the falseness of it, and to begin to get the notion of the, the absolute wonder that lies beyond that, stepping beyond that, because it's an absolute wonder and it's unexplainable, but it's real. also helps in developing the faculties and the causes of the strength and the, the, the causes of the, the slipping of the knots of the abandonment because abandonment say you have to make great effort to abandon but actually abandonment comes naturally abandonment comes when you have already made great effort to see suffering, to see the causes, to see the fetters, to understand their role in samsara. And through understanding and seeing them with the Dhamma eye, through contemplating the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering and its causes, to not to just know suffering has a cause, the Second Noble Truth. Uh, but to find what are those causes, clinging, yes, but clinging to what? Clinging to views, clinging to notions, clinging to things through wrong view of self-identification, clinging to those things and nurturing them, the emotions and the conditioned thoughts and the thoughts which stir the emotions and the emotions which cause more proliferation of thought which then stir the emotions which eventually stir the mind into madness and the mind then commands the body and the tongue to speak in madness and then when the madness subsides there remains only the residue and when the good person returns the, the regret is bestowed upon it that good person is not bestowed upon the evil person because whenever the evil per the evil element is present, the madness is present, then the good person is not present. The sanity is not present. But it is the san the sanity which suffers for the madness. Which is the life of a Buddha is the life of a, any enlightened person. Some of them live in very hard situations and some may live in what seem like comfortable situations but in fact they all endure the same basic sufferings of samsara some are more conscious of it some are not conscious of it at all and some are less conscious of it but the key lies as far as I can see to now in abandonment And I think, well, I've missed a few things I thought about today for recording. They're not going on this one. But this was about abandonment. And um, I think that's about complete. So, 
that's me signing off <laughs>